Well, I hope you got a Bible, and if so, would you make your way to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. On Sunday mornings, we're making our way through the book of Daniel, verse by verse, continuing a study we've started, hoping that God meets us in that. Again, hoping you have a Bible in your opening. Again, if you have to do it electronically, however that works, do that. You guys in our overflow, those watching online, we invite you as well. Be fully in. Connect to this. Grab a Bible. Join us so that his word would just be open to you, longing that God would speak to each and every one of us by his word. So with Bibles open, let's take another moment in prayer and ask that God would just give us hearts to hear what he would have us to hear. Would you join me? Father, thank you that you are a God who is working. Thank you for your word. Help us today to hear it. Would you just look upon us now and and just anything that has us not listening, unable to fully comprehend or take into our hearts. Lord, would you just work? Would you give us ears to hear what your Spirit is speaking to us? God, I ask for that. I ask that for each one of us, that you would help us to hear you, and you're the only one that can do that, who can help us understand truth, but then apply it very personally, specifically and effectively. You're the one that can do that. I ask you to do that for each of us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So how do you do the right thing in a a world that has gone wrong? In so many ways, that's our theme, right? If you've been with us in the the book of Daniel, we have titled our series in the book of Daniel, Living Right Side Up in an Upside Down World. That in many ways, it becomes one of the great themes for us to understand how do we do that? How do we do the right thing? How do we live right when the world is wrong? Much to learn in the book of Daniel, but we have already touched on perhaps the most important principle found there that begins here in chapter 1, that begins here in what we talked about last week. If you were here, we talked about this place of being resolved, that it tells us of Daniel that he had purposed in his heart. Can I remind you right now, because I need you to understand, that is probably one of the most powerful and definitive lessons within the book of Daniel that's going to work its way throughout the book of Daniel. So if you missed last week's message, I invite you to go back and get that. Even if you heard it, you might want to hear it again. And I got to be honest, I wish I could say it better than I said it. I always wish that, though. I mean, that's just honestly true. But I wish, because I just know this, it's such a powerful reality. Can I quickly remind you, for you guys who specifically hear what we talked about last week, that we looked at this place of having this purpose in our heart, and we noted that it was meant to be something that's already decided. It's not an ongoing, it's not something that we're deciding on the fly, it's something that we have each personally made a decision, and it's firm. It's firm, but it's a core identity issue. Much there, but please understand, it's not just being stubborn. It's not being, you know, slow to receive. It's an idea of understanding who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, and saying, hey, I don't move from that. This is who I am. This is who, what, what makes me who I am, and this world, I cannot let go of that. That gives us the ability to be consistent, to overcome struggles, but it is a key. It is a key for upright living. It's a key that helps us get there. And I just need to say again, that principle is so huge, so big, so important that we understand. And it's that which we want to continue talking about this morning. But again, just telling you there's so much to get there, to to be resolved, that God's intention is that you and I be a people of godly conviction, resolve, and a world that is confused. Well, this morning we want to see that, and we want to see a little bit how it plays out. So let's just go back. Let's read the whole section we're going to talk about this morning, and then we'll make our way through it. So you got your Bibles open there to Daniel 1. We begin in verse 8, where we see that resolve. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord, the king, fear, fear my Lord the king, who has appointed your food and drank. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are of your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. 
So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. At the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of the delicacies and the wines that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill, to, uh, skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, so we watch this living out. Daniel has this purpose, this purpose of heart to live for God in the midst of that world. He's made that purpose and he's firm. This morning we want to continue to talk about that, but we want to frame that. We want to see that there are a number of things that work its way around that, the way that Daniel applies that, but let me seek to make that clear. When I say frame, I hope that kind of under, makes it clear. The idea is that this is going to help us focus on that, but it's just a frame. The key is to have this resolve and purpose and heart. If you take away that, then nothing else we're going to say is going to really be that definitive. It, this helps us see it. This frames it like a frame around a picture, but the emphasis is still the picture. The emphasis is still that Daniel has this resolve and purpose of heart, but we do get to see some ways that that is framed. First of all, I want you to understand it was framed in what I want to call gentleness. Gentleness, yeah, we want to think that through because that's certainly happening here. Now, to get there, we need to begin with just a quick reminder about where Daniel is. He's in Babylon. These people that he's going to be dealing with, these are legitimately his enemies. Daniel has been conquered. Israel's been conquered. Judah's been conquered. Daniel has been taken captive from Israel, removed 2,000 miles to Babylon. He's a prisoner in many ways. He's now a subject in this ungodly realm. He's not there. These are not, this is not his heroes. This wasn't a choice for him. These are the people that conquered and will conquer and kill a lot of the, of the Jews of Israel. You need to understand that because there is some sense of looking at that if you miss it, because sometimes when we think about some of the things we're going to talk about, we find ourselves thinking, but I so disagree. I'm so, there's, there's such a wrong thing that's happening. And Daniel's world was wrong. It was broken, and yet he's going to live out this purpose of heart, and he's going to do so with a gentleness. He's going to do so with an honoring approach. I mean, did you already catch it? We read it. You saw in verse 8, here he has this godly resolve, and he goes to the man who's been pointed over them, and it says he requested at the end of verse 8 of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He goes to him and asks permission. He goes to him and asks for, for them to grant him the ability to do that. And there's a graciousness to that. There's a gentleness to that. In fact, he's going to end up telling him, hey, you can test us. There in verse 13, it says, therefore let the appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, it, it, it seems good to you, you can deal with us. There's a gentleness to that that actually becomes something that flows throughout the entire book of Daniel. We'll see it again in chapter 2 when, when Daniel's there and he, and, and he gets it to deal with the king when he's actually seeking to just kill so many of the wise men. It says that Daniel goes in and asks him, would you give us time? 
When Daniel gets to go in chapter 4 and talk to Nebuchadnezzar about things that God is showing him, he says, my Lord made the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. When he's got a difficult message for Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't gloat in it and rub it in. He's like, I wish it was somebody else I had to tell this to. I mean, this is a hard thing to hear. In chapter 6, when Daniel is there in the lion's den or comes out of it, he says, May God, my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. There's an amazing kind of atmosphere that Daniel's walking in in this moment, a gentleness that is so real and I want to tell you is so right. Convictions that are held wrongly so often mess up the convictions. Convictions are not to be framed with rage, not to be framed with anger, not to be framed with violence or vitriol or anger. It's not the way that God longs for the convictions he has us to have in this world to be framed. Daniel feels strongly about what, he, what, he's, what he's seeking to do, but understand this, he's not burning down any buildings. He's not, you know, tearing up somebody's chariots. He's not punching somebody in the face. He's not yelling. He's not cruel. He's not angry. He's not, he's not dealing with it at all that way. He's dealing with it in, in a way that though he is firm in his conviction, it's a gentle, which is an amazing thing. Now, you guys know this, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're aware. We live in a world that maybe it's this way now more than it's ever been. At least it feels that way that this seems to so dominate exactly what's happening in our world, where people supposedly have convictions, but it's become violent and destructive and angry. And I just want to tell you that that's not helpful. It's even wrong. Now, somebody's listening to me right now, and you're wanting to respond to me. In fact, you're even thinking about sending me an email or text right now, and you're going to say, but Jim, if you just understood, if you understood how bad these things are, you would understand why they're so angry. I'm not in any way questioning any of, the, of, of a conviction, or wrong. I'm just saying that that messes everything up, that when it's framed in anger, it's not going to help anything. Now, you guys know this, right? I mean, I think for most of us, we were probably raised this way, right? For most of you, your parents, you teach your kids, you know, you tell them, hey, two wrongs will never make a right. I mean, just because somebody else does wrong, it's never going to fix it by you doing wrong to them. It is never, ever, ever going to be the solution. It might be wrong that they're doing, but you doing wrong. That's never going to improve the situation. I think about how real that is, and I think about some of the convictions that flow. I think about, you know, just how that's approached, and I find myself thinking of one of those famous quotes from Martin Luther King Jr., and some of you recognize, especially as we think about how that's being lived out in our world right now. He simply said it this way. He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He says, if it's darkness, if it's hate, it's never going to be driven out by more darkness. It's never going to be driven out, you know, if, 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 there's, a, if there's hatred, it's never going to be driven out by being hateful. It's never going to work that way. It never does that. I just need you to hear that. I need you to kind of let that kind of roll over your heart. In fact, I'll give it to you out of the book of James. In the book of James in chapter 1, it says, For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I love how James is able to take just massive things and say them so simply, but also understand how definitively. It doesn't come across maybe as strong in the English as it is in the Greek language. It has the idea that it could never happen. The wrath of man could never, ever, ever, ever produce the righteousness of God. That when man's wrath gets engaged, it will never do what's eternally good, ever. It's, just, it's not like, you know, one time out of it, it's never. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Get our wrath engaged into it, and it messes it up every time. For you Bible students, you can think about somebody even like Moses, one of the most humble men in the world, but his anger at the children of Israel, at their just defiance, becomes the thing that messes up his life and hinders him from so much of what God could have had for him. The wrath of man, it's troubling. It can mess up everything. I think about it in Timothy, 2 Timothy, it would say it this way, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle. 
that's where we're kind of thinking about it. There's this idea of gentleness, and it's held all the way through the Scripture, but it's, again, held into this contrast. It's not, we're not meant to be quarreling. There's, the, there's a way of doing that that's done just altogether wrong. There's a way that that goes wrong, and he's calling us to do it differently, that we are meant to display our convictions. We're not to lose our convictions. We're not to lay down our convictions. We're to be a, a people who are resolved, but like Christ, we are to display that truth in love. He does it better than anybody, by the way. I mean, think about Ephesians where it tells us to speak the truth in love, and that's the call for our lives. But Jesus does it so well. I love in Matthew's gospel, it's a quote out of the book of Isaiah speaking of Jesus, and it says it this way, behold, God speaking, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. God looking at Christ and saying, this is the one that I'm pleased with. He's the one that represents me. He's the one that is the one that my heart is engaged in, my spirit's upon him, and he's going to bring justice. He's going to declare righteousness. He's going to declare what, what's right in a broken, upside-down world. And then he says this, he will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. When Jesus is coming to do this, he doesn't come and burn down buildings and punch people in the face. He doesn't come and, and, and quarrel. He's not, his voice is not heard in the streets, you know, yelling and shouting and, and doing that. He says, that's not the way he's coming. He's not the way he's bringing justice. That's, that's not the way it works. That's not going to work into the way it comes. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, both in the display of truth, but even its effect on those around him. See, the next verse is interesting. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. A bruised reed, you probably understand it, but just picture it. It has this idea of, of looking at a, a, a reed, and it's bruised. It's been damaged. Somebody has hit it, so it's, it's kind of just barely hanging on by, by a thread. Similarly put, a smoking flax has the idea of a flame. that It's just, it's almost gone out. I mean, it's smoking and, and the flame is flickering. But there's a gentleness to Christ that walks in the midst of this world that doesn't damage those. And put simply, when anger becomes a part of who we are, we damage people around us. And we, we, we injure those. He says, he didn't do that. He, de he deals with, with those rightly because he declares justice. He's going to bring that forward. And in him, the Gentiles will trust. That's how Christ is. That's who you and I are called to be. So Paul would be able to say it this way in 2 Corinthians. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He says, I'm pleading with you, but I'm doing so like Jesus. He is, he is meek and gentle, and that's how I'm seeking to plead with you in the same way. I'm seeking to call you to the right things, but it is a gentle way of doing that. In fact, in Philippians, Paul would say it this way, let your gentleness be known to all men. That's just a powerful statement. Let your gentleness be known to everybody. It should be a part of who we are. It's not just a situational thing. Let our gentleness, it should mark who we are in this world. Doesn't mean we don't have convictions. We need to have convictions, but they need to be held in gentleness. In fact, I read to you out of Timothy. Let me go back and finish that quote. It says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. He says, you know, you want to do this in a way that's, that's honestly winsome, that's honestly in a way that you, yes, you're telling people that they're wrong, yes, you're, 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 you're showing forth your convictions, but you're doing so in gentleness and patience and humility so that that might actually do something good in the midst of that, that to do it wrong becomes not helpful. The wrath of man will never do it. Your anger is never, ever, ever going to bring about real righteousness. Now, I just need you to see, hear that because in one sense, again, it's so appropriate in our culture. And you guys know, burning down buildings, tearing up vehicles, punching people in the face, angry words, it's so much a part of our culture. 
We have news media that's so vindictive sometimes in places. We have social media that is crazy so, that people are so mean. I mean, the way that they say what they believe sometimes is so insulting, so diminutive, so just speaking bad and evil of people. And I want you to know that and see that that's that's just not going to do good. But let's be clear. We're not going to fix the world with this, nor am I speaking to them. I'm speaking to you. Right now, we're not talking about this so that we can just go, yeah, I can't believe people are doing that. I can't believe people are like that. If that's where you are right now, move from that because the point is, I need to not be that way. You need to not be that way. What we need to understand is that we are to have convictions in this world. We're not to be in a place that we have no conviction, but there ought to be a place that it's shaped and formed and framed with a gentleness so that the way we say what we say looks a lot like Jesus, that it's not insulting and and, and I'm just telling you that's not a minor thing because I need to say it again. Even if you're right and you say it with anger, you're wrong because you've done it in a way that's never going to produce the righteousness of God. You are never going to see that go good. It is not ever going to work. Not, not ever. It's never going to produce real righteousness. And if that's what we're longing for, then, then we want to make sure that our convictions, the things that we believe in, our, our godly resolve, it is meant to be Christ-like. It's meant to be shaped with gentleness. Daniel does. I mean, he does it really, really well. I want you to see that and then see it again throughout the book, but it's also more than that. Yes, he's gentle, but there are a couple other things that frame this in this passage that are worth your noting. Not only is he gentle, but he's encouraging. He's one that speaks encouragement. Yet one of the fun things is to understand something happens in this text. Somewhere it happens where the he becomes we. Yeah, go back and see it. Verse 8, you read it a moment ago, see it again. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile. Daniel's purposing. I mean, he's making this firm decision. He's saying no. But by the time it gets played out, it's no longer just Daniel. We get down to verse 13, and he says, then let our appearance be examined before you. Yeah, our? Yeah, back in verse 11, Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Somewhere it happens where it becomes this. And one of the questions that we have to ask is, was Daniel's conviction something that motivated these other three guys? Did Daniel's resolve encourage them to do the right thing? Is it kind of a positive peer pressure? Hey, sometimes it can be that way. Peer pressure is real. And it can be a very negative thing, but sometimes it can be a positive thing. That when somebody's doing the right thing, it can begin to motivate other people to respond. That those kinds of convictions can become contagious. And it's supposed to be that way. I mean, it's supposed to be that way. If you have godly convictions and there's a resolve that God is building in your life, good for you. I mean, I hope it's happening and I hope it's strong in you. But it's not supposed to just stay there where it's really a godly, God-given resolve, it's meant to be something that we become influencers of those around us. That there should be some that go, you know what, you're right. I want to do that too. (laughs) I mean, that maybe Daniel's resolve motivates them to be so resolved. What God looks for you and me is that we are meant to be those who encourage each other in that. That his plan for how you and I do the right thing in a world that is wrong, that one of the keys to being able to do that is godly encouragement. Think about it this way. In Hebrews, it says that this, in chapter 3, exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort or encourage one another. How often? Daily. How much do we need it? Again, <laughs> again, I needed it, needed it yesterday and we need it again tomorrow. That there's a dailiness to this because this world is trying to shape us. 
that we could be molded by sin. Sin could move us to be people that we shouldn't be, and that's happening in every one of our lives. So part of the battle to overcome that is encouragement, that godly people are meant to be encouraging each other to keep going, to hold fast, to stay strong. And he says, you got to do this daily. You got, it's going to have to be a daily part of your life. Think about it this way. In chapter 10, we get a familiar verse. In chapter 10, in verse 24, it says, we are not to be those who are forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. This is one of those verses that is much talked about in this season, and rightly so, that we think about so much that is happening in our world, and definitely true within the the COVID season, but honestly, there's other things that are affecting it as well, that in one sense, people are finding themselves not gathering and not being a part of uh, of the body of Christ, and so we're recognizing that this is definitively not who we are. We're meant to be a people who don't forsake that, who don't forsake being a part of the body of Christ, the assembling of ourselves together. In fact, as we see Jesus' day approaching, we're supposed to do that so much more. But one of the reasons is because of godly encouragement. In fact, that's how the verse began. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. That one of the keys is that we are to be thinking about each other and encouraging one another that part of why we need this is because we need each other. We need to be involved in each other's lives so that that becomes encouraging. Now, let me be really clear. Maybe you're watching online with us right now, and again, in this season of space, you're not really ready to be back in church and you're concerned about the COVID uh, just atmosphere in the midst of this, we just want to say we love you and we totally understand. It might be that you're making a really good choice right now to be joining us online and we want to tell you it doesn't mean that you're defying this by where you are. Oh, please hear me. I hope the COVID season passes soon. And I will tell you this, that online church will never take the place of gathering together in person because it's so much more than a sermon. It's so much more than just hearing a message. There's something about being together with God's people. Now, you might be caught out of that as you're watching online, but please understand this. It doesn't mean that you don't, that this isn't a part of your life. It does mean that you're going to have to work at it more, just more purposely. That if you're going to be connected to other believers, you're going to have to be reaching out to them with phone calls and texts, and, and you might be doing really well at that, even though you're watching online, and we're just glad. We just want to tell you that's really, really important because we need this. We, we need what that is. In fact, let me say it a different way. Maybe you're here right now and you're feeling really good about that. You know what I mean by that? You kind of got the feather and the cap. I'm here at church. You, you tell them, Pastor Jim. You tell those people. And I'm just telling you, you being here doesn't necessarily mean you're doing this. You could be here and be just as isolated. You, you come in late. You leave early. You talk to nobody. Nobody knows what you're going through, and you don't know what anybody else is going through. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is saying, I want to know, how are you doing? Can can I encourage you? Is there something I can pray for you? Uh, It's the kind of place that we need that kind of encouragement. That part of gathering together as the body of Christ is not just hearing the message, it's being together and then encouraging each other. And he tells you, I want you to think about it. I want you to look for somebody. The kind of thing you come into church and you're going to look, is there somebody I can encourage? <laughs> is there somebody I can just say, hey, keep going, don't give up. I mean, don't give in to, I mean, there's a daily battle here and I'm just wanting to be a positive force in your life. That's who we are. And that's not a minor thing. And Daniel seems to do that well. It's so important because we can think about it this way. In Proverbs 13, it would tell us, he who walks with wise men will be wise but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Who you choose to be that influence in your life, they're going to shape who you are for good or for evil. In fact, it goes on in Proverbs 12 and would say, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. That if you choose to have those that speak into your life who are evil, they're going to pull you down. But if you choose good, say, I want to I have those kinds of connections. I want to have a Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael kind of friendship where I have people that are encouraging me in, in his ways. That becomes effective. 
I think about it when Proverbs 7, 27, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend, that two people come in together, almost like iron, but we leave each other better. We leave each other sharper. We leave each other stronger. That's the kind of things that are supposed to be happening in our lives, and it's needed and necessary. In the book of Malachi, we get one of my favorite verses that talk about this, and it says it this way in Malachi 3, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance is written before him. Catch the scene. It's a similar scene to Daniel. It's a very difficult space in time. There's a whole lot of people that aren't doing well. There's a, a, a remnant that seems to be holding fast to God. And God says, you know, there are these people. There are some, they, they fear God. I mean, they, they're trying to live for God. They're trying to honor God. And you know what they're doing? They're talking. They're encouraging one another. They're speaking to one another about that kind of thing. And God says, he's listening. He, he's listening. He heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him. I have kind of a silly childlike imagination, so I just imagine it. I can imagine, like, in heaven, it's like, a God, you know, this is happening. It's like, shh, 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 everybody be quiet. Did you hear that? Like, right there. Did you hear them? Did you hear them talk and encourage one another? In Christ? Write that down. <laughs> Put that in a book that we can have here in for heaven forever, because that's the kind of conversations that are so needed for godly living. Right there. If, if God's doing this now, and I would put to you, he is, is there any of your conversations that God said, I was listening when you and your friends were talking? And just, we wrote that down because I loved what you said to one another. I loved the way you encouraged one another. I loved how you, 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 you strengthened one another because that's a godly thing. I just want to tell you, that's what he's talking about. That's what Daniel's doing. He's got this godly encouragement so that he's framing this godliness in a way that he's encouraging other people. It's meant to be that way. If we're going to live this thing out well, if we're going to live a godly resolve, it needs to be gentle. It needs to be encouraging, where we're literally encouraging others to continue doing and walk, that we see that in a way that we're not just critical. We're not just judging. We're encouraging other people to, to live for God, and he's longing for you and I to be that way. Okay, so it's gentle. It's also dependent. There's a dependency that you have to understand in this text, which is really quite honestly important. When you think about everything that's happening, please understand this. The test that Daniel asks for he and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah to be put under, it's dependent on God. So you read down there, verse 13. Daniel's telling this servant who's over them. We'll just start in verse 12. Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to, to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you see fit. So deal with your servants. I need to just say this as clear as I can. This is not about diet. This is not about that Daniel's choosing a healthy lifestyle and these others are choosing an unhealthy lifestyle. Now, I just want you to know, I know that some of you are like, you, that's what you they're eating vegetables and water, and it's just, it's just going to be such a healthier thing. No, please understand. That might, that might be true, and some of you are, are, are very conscious of healthiness, and we probably need your encouragement. But that's not this. That's not this. This isn't a place that, honestly, because he's choosing this, that given a 10-day test, that all of a sudden their features are going to be just brighter and better than anything else. There's no natural way to do that. Uh, the, the, and make a comparison to those who are enjoying some of the best food that Nebuchadnezzar can come up with. There's no natural way this happens. This is a supernatural thing. It's a place where Daniel's asking for God, giving an opportunity for God to show up and to do so in a way that validates and allows them to live this godly resolve. And I like that. I like that and I want you to think about it this way, because my fear is that many Christians, really quite honestly, are practical atheists. Now, it's not a term that originated with me. I didn't create it, but I just, I like the description. What do you mean by that? Well, an atheist lives their life believing that there is no God. 
But so many Christians, they say they believe in God, but it doesn't define anything that they are. They live life with actual, no actual reliance on God doing anything. The way they live their life out Monday through Friday it, you know, is pretty much dependent on everything that everybody else is dependent on. That's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place. God is calling us to live lives that we're looking for God to come through. That to live in such a way that if God doesn't come through, it's not going to work. It doesn't mean we have to create those spaces. They exist. But we have to trust Him in those spaces. In fact, let's think about it this way. What if it didn't work? What if God did not come through here? What if 10 days later, the servant came and tested Daniel, and he's like, you guys don't look any better. In fact, you look a little malnourished, you know. You guys look a little peaked. You know, you don't have enough, you know, of, of the things that you would What if that had happened? Well, we need to think about that through Daniel. That'll be one of the key lessons of chapter 3 for you guys who know the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they'll stand before the king and say, our God can. He can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're still going to do the right thing. Even if, he, even if the miraculous thing we know God could do, he doesn't do, we still choose to do the right thing. I put before you that I think that's probably what would have happened in chapter 1. Now, maybe God's being really gracious and strengthening us in Daniel and Shadrach and these guys so that when they get there in chapter 3, they'll be strong. But I think in one sense, had that happened, Daniel would have still said, well, I guess we're still not doing it. <laughs> we're still not going to eat what, what we feel like defiles our identity. We can't, we can't go there. Sometimes that really is the life that we live. Hebrews 11 gives us a life of faith and at the end of Hebrews 11, it gives us hall of faith for some of you who know it. It says, you know, God by faith delivered some out of lion's dens, out of horrendous things. But others, they suffered and they died. And, and, and their faith, it was still faith, even though they trusted in God. It didn't, you know, necessarily fix everything. But they held fast to God. That's what we're longing for and what God is looking for in our lives, that we would be those who say, you know, we're going to trust him. We're going to be dependent on God. Now, the beautiful thing here is God does come through. I mean, one more time, I mean, they get that test, and at the end of the 10 days, they, they just, they, they, everything comes out great. They get there, and at the end of 10 days in verse 15, their features appear better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. I mean, we don't know how many guys were there, but 10 days, they just, they just look, I mean, they're just, they're doing wonderfully. And so they, they, it becomes this place where God shows up, but he doesn't just show up there, he goes further, he blesses them. See in verse 17, it says, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill to, uh, in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God gave, God blessed, God did this incredible way, and they trusted him, they believed in him. They, they believed in what God could do. In 2 Chronicles, we have this amazing verse in chapter 16. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Wow. Now, this is one of these principally true things, that because God doesn't change, he never changes who he is. What he was doing then, he's still doing today. He says his eyes are looking to and fro throughout the whole earth so he could show himself strong. He's looking for people who trust him so he could be their strength and come through. I love that. I mean, it's just an encouraging thought. That said, for you guys who know your Bible, the background to this verse is not actually a good background. If you don't know the story, you might want to go read it later. Read 2 Chronicles chapters 14, 15, and 16. And you'll read the story of a king named Asa, a godly king who begins his kingdom trying to live right for God and walk with him. And in the early days of his reign, an army of the, of the Lubian and the Ethiopian armies come against him with a million men. They are outnumbered. I mean, they are, are, are way, it's too big, it's too hard. Asa gathers his forces, then he makes this incredible prayer in chapter 14. He said, God, this isn't too hard for you. You, you could help us whether there's many or few, and, but we're asking for you. Lord, we're with you, and, and we put our trust in you, and God comes through. They defeat that army, and, and they win, and you know, a prophet comes to him and says, man, a job. as long as you hold fast to God, he's going to be with you. The sad thing is he doesn't. 
Asa grows in years, and he grows in maybe worldly wisdom, we might say. And so near the end of his life, there's another battle. This time the northern kingdom is pressing in and, and, and seeking to oppress Israel. But this time, Asa takes all of his money, and he takes all the money out of the temple of God, takes that which was given to and dedicated to God, and he sends it up to the Syrians. And he makes this political treaty with them so that they could have this alliance that, against the northern kingdom. And here's the scary thing. It works. <laughs> it works. They make an alliance. The, the Syria comes down. The northern kingdom goes away. I'm imagining Asa just kind of patting himself on the back like, I'm a pretty smart dude. You know, I can handle this. Kind of, we, we rolled through this, and that's when this verse comes up. As the prophet just comes to him and says, Asa, don't you understand? God is looking for people who will trust him. And the very next verse, or actually the end of this verse, God says, in this you have done foolishly. You, you, you should have known. You should have trusted God. You, why did you rely on your own kind of manipulation? Because understand this, it wasn't a godly thing. It wasn't a, a godly way of handling the situation. It was a worldly, manipulative, political alliance that defied this trust in God, and, and there becomes the fear. And so I'm telling you again, that's the danger for us, that for many Christians, that's where we live our lives. Practical atheists, that we're not actually depending on God for anything. We got everything covered. You know, it's like, I got my figure, you know, you know, it's good, bad, evil, it doesn't really matter as long as it works, you know, as long as it works. And yet he's telling us God is looking for people. His eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth that to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. I want to tell you that's a way we want to live our lives, with conviction that says, God, I want to believe that you could come through. I'm going to live my life in such a way with a dependence that that's exactly what Daniel is doing. And I like that. Again, it puts in us a, a frame, gives us an understanding of how Daniel's living out his godly convictions. So there's gentleness. There's encouragement. There's dependence. One more. There's an excellence. There's an excellence to the way that Daniel does this. There's an excellence to the, to the way that this happens. And as you watch this whole thing, understand God is blessing. God is blessing, and it's, it's going forward, and his blessing is marked there. But also understand this, they apply themselves. Daniel and his three friends, they've been placed in a three-year training program. That's earlier in the text, stuff we talked about last week. It's kind of like a college, if you want to think about it this way. They're going through all the literature and language and that Babylon wants, us, wants them to learn. We get this blessing in verse 17 that God gives them knowledge and skill and literature and wisdom. Daniel has understanding and visions and dreams. Now at the end of those days, at the end of that three-year training that Nebuchadnezzar assigns them, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So this is the king. This is the, the main guy. He's going to personally interview them. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Yeah, they are, in this moment, they excel. They excel in this. There's blessing here, but please understand, they're also fully involved. It's as if they become the valedictorian and the salutatorians of the school. I mean, they, they, they learn everything. So that when the king tests them on what they were supposed to learn, which was all the language and literature of the Babylonians, they got it. They do very, very well. I need you to understand that that wasn't just God's blessing. It was them being engaged. It's this place that when they are tested, they, 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 they really do shine in the midst of that. And it's because they're involved. There's a sense that this idea of excellence would be defined by the idea that wherever you are, whatever we do, we are meant to do it well. We are meant to do it with all our hearts. In fact, that's exactly what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Wherever you are, give it your best. Be, be that a part of it. In fact, we find that principle throughout the Bible. We find it in Colossians and Ephesians when it speaks about the way we live our lives. That What we're going to do, we should do it for God and we should do it well. 
convictions rightly held don't make us lazy. They don't make us those who are unengaged. In fact, it should be the opposite. We see that in Daniel's life. He applies himself, God's blessing, but he literally does excel. I think about people like Joseph and how that would be true of his life as well. For you guys who understand the story of Joseph, no matter where he was, he gave it his best. If he was a father, he did a good job there. When he's, you know, sold into slavery, he does a good job as a slave. He's the best slave he could possibly be. That goes bad for him. He ends up in prison. He's the best prisoner that he could possibly be. He does it well so that he's exalted there. He then is exalted to be the second most powerful man in the world under Pharaoh. He does a good job. He gives it his, no matter where he is, he's, he's just doing that. And there's something about what that looks like that should be true of us, that there should be a wherever we are. I mean, that's just, that's right here in our life. There ought to be a sense that that defines us in a way that we do it well. In fact, it says an interesting thing, verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. This is how Daniel is living out his life. And somehow as we end chapter 1 here, it tells us he's going to do this all the way to King Cyrus. That's almost 70 years later. This is the beginning of Daniel's life there in Babylon. He's going to be there for almost 70 years till he dies throughout the whole story. But somehow here in chapter 1, it's ending this little section as we look at this resolve and this godliness of Daniel. He says, this is how he's going to do this. That this, this resolve that we see in chapter 1 is going to roll through his entire life. That we think about everything that this is, what we framed it in this morning, there's a sense that I, I think chapter 1 is trying to tell us, hey, this is this man. This is who he is. This is how he lives his life. And there's a desire that you and I would see that in a way to understand this wasn't just a, a quick thing for Daniel. This wasn't like, hey, he did this good for a week. This is, this is him. He's a man of godly resolve that lived with gentleness, encouragement, that he trusts in God and he does so well. And he gives you an eye. A really good example. He shows us in that sense how to live. He shows us how to do hold it to you this morning in a way that isn't just meant to be information, but to say, may God do that in us. May he help us to see how that works and to live lives in this generation that is wrong, that's a wrong world, that is upside down, but we can do it well. I think about it this way. Some of you are reading again with us in Peter and uh, just in our daily Bible reading. Glad you're doing so tomorrow. If you're doing so, you're going to read in chapter two, this verse, where it says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Beloved, I beg you, he says, as pilgrims, as sojourners and pilgrims, as those who are living in a world that is not your world. That's the idea. If you've been with us in Daniel, that's Daniel. <laughs> He's been uprooted from Israel. He's living in Babylon. He's a pilgrim and a stranger. But you're, if you're a Christian... That's you. Philippians tells us our citizenship is in heaven. This isn't really our home. We don't really fit in this world. I mean, it's not our world. We live in this world as not of this world, as pilgrims and strangers. But he says, don't give in to sin. Don't abstain from fleshly lusts which are warring against your soul and have your conduct honorable. Like, do this well. Live excellently. Live gently. Live dependently. Live the things that do this well. He says, you want to do that so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Wow. He says, you want to do this in such a way that your life gives reason for others to believe in Jesus. That's the idea. He says, uh, they want, you want them to glorify God in the day of visitation. Quick biblical understanding. The day of visitation is an interesting term. It has the idea of the day that their soul is visited. From a sovereign, you know, just eternal perspective, can I tell you that God could mark it? Every life has a day. Every life on planet Earth has a day that their eternal life is decided. There are a lot of things that sometimes move to that, a lot of things that move away from it, but there's a day where for those who reject the Lord, there's probably a day that it was their day. It was everything led up to that moment, and that moment is as close as they get to giving their lives to Jesus, and then they move away from it. That's a scary reality. If you know Jesus, you had a day of visitation. 
There was a day that things maybe led up to that moment, but there was a day where you were visited. And if you're a Christian, you became born again. You gave your life to Jesus on that day that determined your whole life, that determined your whole destiny. Everybody has a day of visitation. He says, live in such a way that on people's day of visitation, your life gives them reason to believe. So that when God is sifting and drawing somebody and trying to say, hey, you know what? I love you. I've given my son to save you. That when your life comes into mind, they would think, well, you know what? If I could have what they have, if I could live like they are, then yeah. If I could know the peace and the joy and the gentleness that that person has, I mean, if if that's a real Christian, then count me in. I mean, that's what you want to have happen. You don't want to be the kind of person that on the day, like, if that's a Christian, I don't want it. That person's bitter, angry, mean, cruel, just critical. I mean, why would I want what they have? Like, no, I'm not in. Don't let your life be a reason or an excuse that somebody turns away from God. We want to live in such a way so that we're doing this well, so that on that day, that day that happens, I want to call you to such a life that your life is making such a difference. In fact, let me turn that and say this. It could be that maybe today is your day. Maybe you're here. And again, it's your day of visitation. Crazy enough. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're in our overflow. Maybe you're here in the sanctuary. And so many things have been happening. And right now, that's happening. You can feel it. And you're almost just, okay, am I, you know, did Jesus really come and die for me? Do I, do I believe that? Do I want to give my life to God? And you're wrestling that through. I hope that our lives give evidence to that. I hope you see something in in many of us that say, hey, we believe this. We hope you see the reality of Christ in us. We hope that today that that gives cause. At the same moment, I find myself saying, I'm so sorry, because I know that for many of us, it's not been a perfect thing. We've failed so often in doing that well. Please understand this, where we're weak, God is not. Today, we're hoping that even past us, you would believe on Jesus. If this is your day, that your soul is being decided, that this day would be a day that you would say, okay, I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to recognize who he is and live that way. Today, we invite you to Christ. We invite you in a few moments. We're going to pray for that and invite you to surrender your life to him. We hope that you would. That said, let me just return and speak to us as believers. I hope your life is giving cause to that. I hope anybody that knows you would think, well, if I, I want that, that's certainly what this is. So let's begin pulling this to a close. I don't know where you, I don't know where the weight of what we've talked about has landed. Maybe again, you're outside of a relationship with Jesus. Today we're longing for your soul. Today we're just calling you to Jesus. We're telling you that He's enough. We're telling you that God gave His Son to pay the price for us. He's the one that fixes this broken world. It is a broken, broken world. But our God is good and He's working. We hope that you would surrender to Him. And in a moment, we're going to pray. And in that moment of prayer, we for you to surrender and ask for that. But maybe you're here and you do know Jesus. Maybe what I'm speaking about this morning, it really looks like you. That this is a, a portrait of, of your life, not perfectly, because there's not a perfect person in here. But this is something that God is working in you, then it's a good day just to say, okay, let's keep going. Let's go for the long haul. If, if this could mark Daniel for 70 years, could it mark me? We long that that would be strengthened in you. But maybe you're here this morning and you recognize that does not look like me. Somehow I've been defined by our culture and I've become angry. I've become critical. I've become, you know, manipulative. Instead of being, you know, one who's gentle and encouraging and trusting, there's forgiveness. And today's the day to change it. That's the hope of that. To say, God, I want to, be a, I want to be like Daniel. I want to frame my life in a way that shines the character of God in a godly way. And as much time as he gives us, let's do that. So quietly, let's just take a moment and pray. Wherever that's landed for you, would you just talk to him about that? Would you just talk to him about what that looks like? You take a moment and pray. I'll take a moment and pray. And we'll come back together and close in worship in just a couple moments.
got to think about how faithful you are. That what you tell us is true now, that your eyes are looking to and fro throughout the whole earth, that you could show yourself strong on behalf of those who would be loyal in heart to you. Thank you for giving us examples like Daniel, who did that, who was a man of godly conviction in a confused world, and yet did that in a way that just welcomed your blessing and his gentleness and his encouragement and his trust in you. God, I pray that you would make that reflective of us. Change us where that's not true. May we be those who shine in this broken world. May such godly resolve be framed in such a godly character that makes it clear who you are, and people would be drawn to that on their day of visitation, that our lives would give cause to that. God, we pray for that, and we do pray that you draw to you all, even now here this morning. We trust you in that and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May God meet you in that. May he draw you to all that he has for you. If you have questions after this, by all means, we'd love to just talk to you about that. You can come up and allow us to do that. I do even encourage you, if you haven't done so already this morning, don't leave this place without considering somebody else and encouraging them. Even if you just have to go up to somebody and say, how can I pray for you? That would be an amazing thing. That's what we are as the body of Christ. May we be such people of encouragement. Well, with that, why don't you guys stand? We're going to close in a final song, making God our focus, asking us, him to build us in his ways and lead us in his ways to the world around us. May he do that. With that in mind, I just want to bless you in his name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.